Sup, Chooms? It's been a while, but it is good to be back at y'all with some fresh new content about finasteride. So, any hair loss veteran will tell you that back in the early 2010s, fear-mongering about finasteride was out of control. If you were to go to any forum and ask about finasteride, people would tell you it was the pharmacological equivalent to Russian roulette, and sadly, many people, including myself, bought into the fear-mongering, and that hesitation caused me to not even begin treatment until I had already lost my hairline and required two hair transplants to get back what I had lost. All this could have been avoided had I actually spent the time to do the proper research on finasteride rather than just reading all the unsubstantiated anecdotes from screeching permavirgins online who can't handle the fact that people have had a good experience with the drug, they're too chicken shit to even try, or if they do try, they'll give up the second they imagine anything wrong rather than adjust their titration as a reasonable person would do if they, do, if they did get side effects. So even though there is no shortage of these fear-mongering posts online, it is important to remember that these people do not represent the majority of finasteride users. That couldn't be possible as finasteride is literally prescribed to millions of men across the world. The truth is that the majority of people who take finasteride just pop the pill like they pop an aspirin and they just get on with their lives and never talk about it, which is great on one hand because we have the convenience of being able to take a pill to stop hair loss and then just not even think about it, but sadly, since they don't share their positive experiences online, that means that the majority of content we see online reported from consumers comes from the people who want to promote fear and misinformation about this drug. So when people do any kind of research, they'll inevitably stumble across this hysteria and then be too scared to even start the drug to begin with. Now. I feel personally that I was victimized by this misinformation since it caused me to delay treatment long enough, so I make these videos in hopes of debunking some of the most egregious anti-finasteride propaganda, not just by sharing my own positive experiences, but by taking an objective look at the available research and disseminating, disseminating it in a way that makes it easy for newcomers to the hair loss fight to understand so they can make a more informed decision about the options available to them for treating hair loss. And I I am pleased that over the years, more and more people have been standing up against this anti-finasteride propaganda and fighting back against the doomsayers who tell them that finasteride will inevitably ruin their lives and they have no choice but to just accept the slaphead curse. There is a growing community of people who take finasteride and are not afraid to share their positive experiences with the drug and they are refusing to let the finasteride hate cult bully them into remaining silent about the wonderful things this drug has done for them. These days, the anti-finasteride websites like the PFS Foundation barely get any traffic at all, and research on fake conditions like post-finasteride syndrome has slowed to a crawl because there is nothing to back up its existence other than the inane ramblings of conspiracy theorist trolls online who baselessly claim finasteride made their buttholes numb or turns that turned them transgender somehow. Starting finasteride, I'll say, is possibly the best decision I have ever made in my entire life. I can say with the utmost certainty that my quality of life would have taken a severe turn for the worse had I let myself go bald. So I feel it is my righteous duty to speak out against the slander behind this drug because if the lies about finasteride are left unchallenged, it means there will be more and more young men whose quality of life will suffer because they were too afraid to use finasteride when they still had a chance. I cannot stand by and let that happen. To do so would be a tacit admission that finasteride is evil. So we've done a lot of great work here already in debunking the vitriolic lies of the anti-finasteride conspiracy theorists, but there still occasionally is some obscure study or opinion piece that gets thrown my way and is treated as a serious piece of scientific literature. My content already has addressed most of these anti-finasteride hit pieces, but one article that is still frequently brought up is one titled, quote, The Dark Side of 5A Reductase Inhibitors Therapy, Sexual Dysfunction, High Gleason pro Grade Prostate Cancer, and Depression, unquote. And it appeared in everyone's favorite journal, the Korean Journal of Urology in 2014, and its first author is Dr. Trash. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's actually from Boston University, so how it ended up in a Korean journal is anyone's guess, although I'm assuming we're talking about good Korea here. So I think it's noteworthy to mention here that Dr. Trash is a urologist, not a dermatologist. So this article is mostly from the perspective of a urologist and using finasteride to to treat enlarged prostates and not to treat hair loss. So keep that in mind. 
because in the case of finasteride, at least the standard dose for treating hair loss is only one-fifth of what is used to treat in large prostate, and it is common for patients using finasteride to use even less than that, sometimes as little as 0.25 milligrams every other day, and there are still people who report success on that. So, also, this article, it's not even really a research study. It is just a review article, which means that it is a summary of a lot of studies. And basically, the point made here by Dr. Trash is that 5-AR inhibitors, like all drugs, have side effects, and it's important to be aware of them, which is something literally any doctor will tell you before they write you a prescription for not just finasteride, but literally any drug out there. So I don't know why we needed a review article to tell us something every doctor already knows. So it is no surprise based on its title referencing the binary fight between good and evil in Star Wars with the phrase dark side in its title that this article is overtly negative about these drugs and that is probably why people who don't like my content like to bring it up so often because they think it is some sort of rhetorical kryptonite against anything positive I say about finasteride. Also, since it is a review article, that means it quotes a large number of studies and we can't go into each and every study individually so maybe we can't go quite as balls deep as we usually do, but let's get to the gist of the article at least and sift through all the bullshit so we can dismiss it and go back to talking about how awesome finasteride is. Anyways, they start with an introduction reviewing how the 5AR enzymes work, but immediately make a mistake or maybe a typographic error, which must have escaped the Korean proofreaders or something. They say that 5ARs convert testosterone to 5-alpha dehydroxyprogesterone, which is of course wrong and should be 5-alpha dehydrotestosterone testosterone or DHT. So already not off to a good start here, Dr. Trash. Let's try again, shall we? He then talks about how hormones produced by the 5-AR enzyme undergo further processing by other enzymes, resulting in neurosteroid like uh, neurosteroid formations like allopregnanolone, which of course have important functions in the brain. And you can see this here in figure one to see how this all plays out. So anyways, uh, Dr. Trash and his researchers then talk about how prostate enlargement, also known as BPH, benign prostatic hyper, uh, hypertrophy, can be treated with 5-ARs, which work mostly because uh, prostate growth is dependent on DHT, and the prostate is one of the three areas where DHT is most prevalent in the human body alongside the skin and the scalp, which is why 5-ARs like finasteride and dutasteride also work for hair loss. They then say that 30% of patients on these drugs don't have improvement of the their urinary symptoms and five to seven percent five to seven percent get worse and therefore require surgery and this is definitely a case of glass half empty because uh the other way to look at this is that the majority of patients with bph actually respond well to these drugs so the fact that dr trash prioritizes the negative outliers in an otherwise extremely well tolerated drug makes me think he has some ulterior motive here i mean remember dr trash is not a dermatologist he is a urologist you would not see a urologist about treating hair loss. You would see a dermatologist. So one of the practices of a urologist is to perform prostate surgery on patients. So maybe he's against 5-AR inhibitors since they can treat enlarged prostate in most circumstances and prevent him from making money doing surgery. This is speculation, of course, but it does seem very plausible to me. I mean, why else would he be so anti-finasteride considering it's clinically proven to uh, treat enlarged prostate symptoms, something he specializes in? So anyways, Dr. Trash and the two other co-authors of the study point out, quote, until recently, the two U.S. Food and Drug Administration FDA-approved 5-A-R-I's finasteride and dutasteride were deemed safe and effective in treatment of BPH. However, the adverse effects of 5-A-R-I's were known for some time, but were deemed not clinically significant and were often dismissed with the arguments that the adverse effects are observed in a small number of patients, unquote. Sounds like a good argument to me, if you ask me. I mean, if there's only a small number of patients who get adverse side effects, then why hype up the side effects when we know most people will respond very well to the drug. Are we going to pull statins off the market because some people get muscle aches? I mean, again, I don't see the point here. They then go off on a tangent about how these drugs were looked at to see if they could prevent prostate cancer, even though there wasn't any real reason to think they would. The trial showed both drugs reduced the incidence of less severe prostate tumors, though there was an increase of the incidence in, uh, of higher grade tumors, I should say, but overall, there was no effect on death rates. 
evidence. So the conclusion was that these drugs didn't have any real impact on prostate cancer, be it positive or negative, so there's no point in fear-mongering about it. Nevertheless, the authors of this article several times stress how strongly the FDA disapproved for use in preventing prostate cancer. They say, quote, the lack of evidence that either finasteride or dutasteride reduce incidence of high grade prostate cancer led to strong and overwhelming disapproval of these drugs for chemo prevention of prostate cancers by the panel of scientists and medical experts, unquote. Well, fine, but keep in mind we're talking about prostate cancer here. We are a long way from treating hair loss at this point, and all of this talk about prostate cancer is really completely irrelevant because this article is used by critics of finasteride to attack attack its use as a treatment for hair loss. So Dr. Trash has proven that preventing prostate cancer is not a side effect of taking finasteride. So congratulations, I guess. Well, fortunately, uh, Dr. Trash and his cohorts then briefly mentioned finasteride for hair loss. He says, quote, finasteride is also approved for the treatment of male pattern hair loss, MPHL, otherwise known as genetic alopecia. While many subjects treated with finasteride for MPHL had experienced minimal or no obvious side effects, for some patients, the adverse side effects were manifested in loss of libido, diminished libido, erectile dysfunction, ejaculatory dysfunction, anxiety, depression, and in some cases, contact contemplating suicide, unquote. This is almost the only time they mention finasteride for hair loss in this entire article. They never even mention that the doses used for treatment of hair loss are smaller compared to G uh, the doses used for treating BPH. And it turns out in the rest of the article, the vast majority of the studies quoted are from either rats or older men using these drugs for prostate problems and not from studies of people using finasteride for hair loss. So keep that in mind the next time some neckbearded virgin brings up this article to try to attack finasteride's use as a hair loss treatment. So, they first review the effects of 5-AR inhibitors on sexual function. In Table 1 here, it looks like the 5-AR inhibitors have a bad effect on erectile function, but you need to realize the text to realize all these studies were done on rats, not people. The problem with these studies is that usually the doses of finasteride and dutasteride used are much higher than even the doses used in humans for prostate enlargement. For example, one of the studies uses a dose of 4.5 milligrams per kilogram the body weight, which when in an average human would equate to a dose of 315 milligrams per day, which is 315 times higher the standard dose, which is just one milligram, of course. Also, the rats obviously aren't humans, and in particular, the effect of the 5-AR type 2 enzyme plays a more direct role in neurosteroid development for rats compared to humans, and I talk about that in my video about finasteride and neurosteroids, which I'll link below if you want to learn more about it. So anyways, Dr. Trash then moves on to some of the clinical studies. Let's take a look at say, uh, table two here. They summarize clinical studies done from 1996 to 2014, looking at the incidence of sexual side effects. They looked at reduced libido, ED or erectile dysfunction, and EJD, ejaculatory dysfunction, and it's clear there is increased incidence of these problems in people taking these drugs. And this, some, this is really something that no one has ever denied, but it's also important to realize that all these studies, except for the last one from Gublin, are in a population of older men with prostate problems. In fact, in one of the studies even, in the placebo group, the incidence of reduced libido was 59.6% versus 65.4% on finasteride. So if even the placebo group is reporting side effects that high, we're clearly dealing with a population very different from the average person taking finasteride for hair loss. I'm sure most of these men rode their last rodeo decades ago, so they probably don't even give a shit about things like reduced libido anymore. So if we just look at this study from Gublin, which again was the only study that looked at hair loss, the incidence of reduced libido was 3.3% on dutasteride and it was 5.0% on finasteride versus 1.1% on placebo. So at first glance, this may even give the impression that dutasteride has a lower risk of side effects than finasteride, but if we look at the actual study, there was no statistical difference in the incidence of sexual side effects between the two drugs. To quote another less biased analysis of this Gublin study that I'll link below, quote, 
there was no significant difference found between finasteride and dutasteride sexual side effects, and additionally, a dose-dependent response of sexual side effects for any of the treatment doses of dutasteride was absent. Sexual side effects were found to decrease over time, unquote. So that last sentence about sexual side effects decreasing over time does correlate with the existing research that shows that even if you do get side effects on finasteride, the side effects will usually go away on their own with continued use. So don't think that you have to stop finasteride just because you get sides, because there's a very good chance that the side effects will eventually subside on their own if you just keep on using the drug. But anyways, getting back to the Trash article, Dr. Trash once again brings up five AR inhibitors to prevent prostate cancer, but this is pretty irrelevant, so we'll skip it other than to point out that he repeats a weird line twice verbatim in the text. He says, quote, most importantly, if 5-ARIs indeed prevent prostate cancer development, then how come they are not approved for the, the treatment of prostate cancer? Unquote. And he then repeats the exact same line all over again, and I'll show it right here. So, okay, fine, we get it. Wonderful, you've made your damn point. Now please, drop it. Anyways, the last section is on neurosteroids, and Dr. Trash spends a lot of time saying how important neurosteroids are for brain health. However, here he really has no hard data linking these drugs to clinical neurological problems. Instead, he just says that neurosteroids are important to the brain, and that 5-AR inhibitors affect neurosteroids, so therefore they must be bad for the brain, right? This is a pretty simplistic way of looking at things from a physiological standpoint, though. I mean, to give you an example, vitamin K is important for the body, but there are still drugs out there that lower vitamin K to prevent health problems like blood clots. So just because something is important in the body doesn't mean inhibiting it is always going to be bad. He also says, quote, inhibition of 5A reductase by finasteride and dutasteride in the course of treatment of non-life-threatening conditions such as male pattern baldness, alopecia, or BPH may have detrimental effects on the CNS, central nervous system, unquote. Well, you know what? That's just like, you know, your opinion, man. He literally just drops this claim and uses no research to back it up whatsoever. Fortunately, I have already talked in depth about the role finasteride plays in influencing neurosteroids, and I'll link that video below in case you haven't seen it yet. Anyways, he also speculates and even uses the word speculate, and I'll just go ahead and quote him here. Quote, we speculate that 5A reductase inhibitors may contribute to reduced levels of neurosteroids in the central nervous system, and this may enhance the progression of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. So that's an interesting claim, but he doesn't provide any evidence to back it up. However, in a study published after Dr. Trash's paper, which included over 80,000 men treated with 5AR inhibitors, there was no increased long-term risk of dementia. And keep in mind, Alzheimer's disease is a form of dementia. So no respect to Dr. Trash here, but I think a research paper with 80,000 subjects holds a lot more weight than his claims. So, Dr. Trash then briefly mentions a mouse study saying that the ability of progesterone to prevent seizures in mice was reduced 50% by giving finasteride, but seizures are not a side effect of finasteride, so what is the relevance here, I wonder? In an article I found addressing seizures in finasteride, it clearly states that, quote, There is no evidence that finasteride causes seizures in humans who do not have epilepsy. Finasteride is used clinically for the treatment of benign prosthetic hypertrophy and male pattern hair loss. Seizures have not been reported as an adverse event of finasteride treatment. Given the long experience of the drug, it is safe to say that it does not cause epilepsy. It's interesting that epilepsy was even researched as other than maybe a few worthless anecdotes I've read online, I have never heard anyone try to claim finasteride has anything to do with epilepsy. So it seems what Dr. Trash is doing here is he's just throwing anti-finasteride spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks, and then the anti-finasteride clowns lick the sauce ravenously off the wall thinking they finally found the proof they need to justify using finasteride as a scapegoat for all of their personal failings. Finally. Dr. Trash brings up depression, and I did do a video about uh, finasteride's link to depression, which I'll link below if you want more details. But anyways, the short story about finasteride and depression is that depression is a very rare, but it is, uh, it's a very rare side effect, but it's still included as a possible adverse uh, side effect of the drug, and you can find it on the package insert. And this could possibly be due to its effect on neurosteroids, although the exact mechanism isn't known. It is a bit of a moot point, though, because even if we are to accept that finasteride has a very 
very small chance of causing depression. We all know losing your hair is one of the most depressing things ever. So if I'm going to be depressed one way or the other, I'd rather be a depressed man with hair than a depressed bald dude. So this article brings up nothing here that we don't already really know about finasteride. I mean, nobody is claiming finasteride has zero risk of side effects. So the only thing Dr. Trash has achieved here is stating the obvious, as if we don't already have enough crybabies reminding us how horrible finasteride is supposed to be um, on a daily basis, but pretty much. However, not being satisfied with just that, Dr. Trash then decides to throw a very gratuitous nod to the PFS Foundation by saying, quote, persistent side effects have been noted even after discontinuing discontinuation of finasteride treatment from three months to 11 years, suggesting that the adverse effects of finasteride may be permanent, unquote. He also states, quote, the side effects are potentially harmful in some individual individuals and in young men may even be persistent or irreversible, unquote. He doesn't go into any further detail or analyze the arguments for and against PFS like I do in my videos on the topic. So if you want to hear about why I don't think there is any evidence for PFS for post-finasteride syndrome, then go ahead and check out my videos, which I'll link below uh, on the subject. And pretty much all Dr. Trash is doing here is claiming that just because some people have said things about finasteride, that means that it must be true and we need to take it seriously, which is ridiculous because the burden of proof is still on them. I mean, there are people out there who claim that the earth is flat, but we don't take them seriously because there's no evidence of that. And the PFS crowd isn't taken seriously because they have no evidence to back up their claims either. And yes, that's right. I just compared the PFS Foundation to the Flat Earth Society, and that's more of an insult to the Flat Earth Society than anything. So so Dr. Trash mercifully closes his article by saying that finasteride and tasteride do do some good things for people with prostate problems by reducing prostate volume by 17 to 19 percent, thus alleviating urinary tract symptoms. So I guess he's throwing us a bone to try to convince us he's not completely biased against finasteride. You know, it kind of reminds me of like when people write really racist things online and then they'll remind us they're not really racist because they have a black friend or something. But still, he can't resist bringing up the disapproval of the FDA of these drugs for for treating prostate cancer again. He says, quote, this is also corroborated by the overwhelming FDA disapproval of these drugs for the chemo prevention of prostate cancer. All right. Damn it, we get it. Until you can show me an example of a single doctor who actually recommends using finasteride to treat prostate cancer, I'm going to cho continue to choose not to give a fuck. So please stop stressing this worthless point. Thank you. So was there anything at all I liked about this article? Well, it has a pretty cool sounding title since it references Star Wars, but this article basically just confirms the things we already know about 5AR inhibitors like finasteride, dutasteride, and that is that despite the fact that they work extremely well and have a low incidence of side effects, they can still, in very rare circumstances, have sexual side effects and can cause depression in, small num in a small number of users, which again is completely irrelevant because if you're going bald, then chances are you're probably going to be depressed and sexless as it is. Also, even though this article is brought up on crappy hair loss forums all the time, most of the article applies to people using these drugs for prostate problems and not for hair loss. And a lot of the article is just speculation and opinion-based rather than evidence-based, and there's a couple of gratuitous plugs for the PFS Foundation thrown in as well without going over the data in detail, but I guess it's still popular because it tells those cuckoos, cuckoos what they want to hear. So Dr. Trash and the Just Shave It Bro crowd tell us we should feel the dark side of an asteroid and be at peace with our genetic curse. But the truth is, is that peace is a lie. There is only passion. Through passion, we gain strength. Through strength, we gain power. Through power, we gain victory. Through victory, our chains are broken. Finasteride shall set us free. See you guys next time.